This is A View from the Bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. American Demons. That's this week on A View from the Bunker. Spiritual warfare is where the rubber meets the road for us as Christians, but often we treat it as though it doesn't really exist. Well, during the month of November, we're tackling this subject head on as we celebrate the release of Sharon's new novel, The Poisoned Pawn, book eight in the Red Wing Saga, a series that teaches spiritual warfare through compelling stories featuring characters that you come to know and love. As part of this special package, we're offering the important new book by our friend Vicki Joy Anderson, They Only Come Out at Night, where she looks at the phenomenon of night terrors or sleep paralysis, examines what the medical community says about it, and then digs into the spiritual forces behind it and the good news that there is a way to make it stop. We're also offering our two-disc DVD set, Unmasking the Ancient Gods, a series of presentations on spiritual warfare, everything from the UFO phenomenon to Jack the Ripper and spiritual warfare in the 19th century, which is really where the storyline of the Red Wing saga begins. Bought separately, this package is worth $65, but it's yours for just $35 plus shipping and handling during the month of November only. Our spiritual warfare special offer Available only at our online store, gilberthouse.org slash store. And as always, we thank you for your prayers and your support. Here in America, we've been so indoctrinated with a cult of scientism that we don't recognize supernatural evil when it's literally staring us in the face. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. It is time once again for our monthly Iron and Myth Roundtable. And uh, this month, we're picking up on a thread that we kind of left hanging last month after our discussion of Hollywood and uh, the gods as they are portrayed in pop culture, because it occurred to us, and uh, credit uh, Pastor Doug Van Dorn for this thought, that uh, this absorption of these uh, doctrines of demons through movies, television, graphic novels, and so on, is such that it may actually be opening up our well, ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren, to these uh, to these spirits. So joining us for our monthly roundtable discussion, the aforementioned uh, pastor of um, the uh, Reformed Baptist Church of Northern Colorado in Boulder, the author of Giants, Sons of the Gods, Conspiracy Theory, and others, other books, uh, Doug Van Dorn, the best-selling author and award-winning screenwriter, author of the series Chronicles of the Nephilim, Chronicles of the Watchers, Chronicles of the Apocalypse, and a number of nonfiction books that, uh, based on the uh, the research behind his novels, Brian Gadawa, and our friendly neighborhood PhD, the director of the Institute of Biblical Anthropology and author of Interview with the Giant, Ethno-Historical Notes on the Nephilim, Dr. Judd Burton. Doug, as we were wrapping up last month's program, you really, it's like the second month in a row, you've, you've had sort of like the perfect bow on the uh, on the program as you, you posited the question, is it possible that all of this pop culture, movie, uh, television series, uh, video games, graphic novels, whatever, that are feeding us, our children, our grandchildren, this, this, these doctrines of demons, literally doctrines of demons, is it leading to a, uh, a case where we don't recognize supernatural evil when it's staring us in the face anymore? And I think that's a good place to, to pick up. Are we dealing with demons in America and we just don't recognize them for what they are? As, as you're the pastor here, Doug, uh, what do you see from your, your perspective? Uh, well, in terms of what I see in my, uh, church i don't see anything going on there but well we would hope not the broader culture um yeah well there's lots of things we could talk about the uh tattooing is one of the most interesting things to me like just the rise of it where is it coming from what you know where where did it come from in modern times world war ii in the in the east and stuff like that just the proliferation of it i just think that's fascinating given 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 just a couple of laws and in leviticus about tattooing but um so i was might be a, a way to enter introduce our subject tonight i was just watching joe rogan who had graham hancock and um randall carlson on just three days ago and uh so brand new episode and you know i've read i've read ton of stuff from hancock and and randall's absolutely fascinating guy and they were they were talking mostly about hancock's newest book on america uh i think bc or something like that so all these things, all these uh, 
ancient sites in the Amazon is kind of what the focus of that book was. But then Hancock started going in a direction that he was writing about 15, 20 years ago, talking about ayahuasca trips and some of these other hallucinogenic trips. And I found I found it really interesting because um, he's kind of uh, softened in terms of the way that he presents himself. I, you know, when he when he was first dabbling in this, he he came out with that stuff after his you know most famous books um, came out in the '90s. Started dealing with this uh, ayahuasca stuff, and I, you know, I heard him on a coast to coast a couple times, and I thought this guy's possessed by a demon. I mean, it was really surreal. And I don't get that I don't get that quite that sharp edge from it anymore, but he was making these comments like he goes, I don't think anybody should be allowed to be in public office unless they go on at least a dozen acid trips of some kind before they do it. So the reason I think this is relevant is because here you've got the three of these guys talking uh, you know, about hallucinogenics <coughs> and how how they're helpful, they're beneficial, they can help people that are in deep states of depression, stuff like that. And um, they're talking about this in completely innocent ways. You know, and Hancock will even talk about how, uh, you know, these these trips that you go on, they're most likely not just imaginary. Like they're they're bringing you to some real place. But there's no concept whatsoever that what could be going on here is evil in any way. <laughs> and in fact, everybody needs to be doing this. And it just, you know, then, then of course, my mind as a Christian makes me start thinking about um, why does the Bible, why is it so hard on pharmacia? And, you know, especially what I, I consider like crossing over drugs. What's going on there? And that takes us, you know, right into the heart of what we do um, with the whole watcher side of it. That's really them crossing over to us. But it seems to me that the hallucinogenics are us crossing over to them. And, yeah. um you know, we're kind of we're bridging these gaps that I just don't think God wants us to be bridging. And in their mind, it's a perfectly fine thing. And I guess I've kind of finished it off. They were also talking about how even 10 years ago, you couldn't talk about this stuff in public without being utterly ridiculed and mocked. And today, you know, you talk to anybody who's watching these shows and they're all taking these trips. They're all going on ayahuasca trips. Oh, everybody. It's like mm -hmm. something has radically changed in our culture in terms of this particular topic. And nobody in, you know, in a, with a secular mindset, and I wonder how many even with a Christian mindset have even an inkling that there could be something evil or demonic going on. So I don't know, just to kind of lay that out and maybe you guys can take it from there. Well, I've had the opportunity to interview Rick Strassman, uh, who wrote the book uh, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And then he wrote a follow-up book, and I, I forget what the follow-up book was, but it, it dealt with the Hebrew prophets. But basically, his research into DMT found that um, the volunteers who were, uh, they, they didn't uh, drink the tea, they were injected with it, and uh, found that there were occasions where multiple witnesses would see the same thing at the same time. So right. given that mass hallucination is not really a thing, right. they were seeing something that was going on in a different dimension that was not visible to the people who weren't on the DMT. But his conclusion then, and almost universally, the people who took those trips reported that the the beings that they encountered were either ambivalent to their presence or were openly hostile. In some, case, some cases, violently so. But his conclusion from all this was, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. And Strassman, Dr. Strassman was raised in a religious Jewish home. He is now... Well, I, I don't know where he is, but uh, he, he, he believes that the Hebrew prophets got their visions from DMT or through s some process and that we should experiment more with DMT so that we can replicate what the Hebrew prophets did. Forgetting that says something he, almost exactly the same. He said, I think every single religion that's ever been invented started with some guy on a trip. Right, right. And so that would happen well, uh, in Christianity yeah. and, and, and Judaism. And I, I think both Hancock and, if I'm not mistaken, Strassman also said that a, the resin in acacia wood uh, was supposedly one of one of those that could have been the the, the culprit there. And I, as to whether there's, there's any substance to that, I, I don't, I, I doubt it. Um, that that's a pretty broad statement to make. That every, you know, uh, perhaps most most religions. 
uh, found their pantheon of deities that way. Uh, but uh, as for the, the the Hebrew prophets, I think you could you could you could pound the brakes pretty hard on, on that one. <laughs> uh, but it, it Doug, to your point, uh, it is rather strange. I mean, you know. I think there have even been several reality TV shows that have been put out in the last decade uh, where people go in and and, and ingest uh, ay- ayahuasca. Um, it, it's it's unnerving. It's this sort of uh, this cl- this clear uh, uh, embracing of of that side of pharmacia. The the old uh, uh, passages in Enoch that talk about the 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 teaching of root cutting and the binding of roots and spills and, uh, you know, very, very really clearly, whatever you want to, whatever, whatever you want to call it, it's some sort of residual watcher tech, uh, that's been tapped into because our bodies produce this, our, our, our digestive tracts. That's the other thing that, that doesn't often get talked about in the ayahuasca, uh, yahe, whatever the hallucinogen might be. But in the case of ayahuasca, the, the so-called vine of heaven, our our stomachs actually make an enzyme that inhibits the DMT release. And in other words, you you have to take a, a, another concoction with the ayahuasca uh, in order to suppress the production of that enzyme, so that you can you can go into this altered state. <clears throat> right. And so how so, could uh, how could uh, you have how could man have just kind of gotten to this? All by himself, by trial and error. It's, like, it's almost impossible. I think you and I, Jed, were talking about that maybe in private or something. Mm-hmm. Might be worth going into a little bit more from your point of view. Well, I, I'm I, I'm looking at this as both believer and anthropologist. You know, the, this these sorts of of we're sort of zoning in on on I think Hancock's experience with. What ayahuasca here, which he's talked about rather prolifically. He's re- actually written, I know he's written one book. Uh, I'm not sure that there may be a follow up to it, but um, yeah, for uh, as I understand it, and I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in, in DMT containing plants, but as I understand it, in most of these, these indigenous cases, you know, whether you're talking about South America or Central America or, or, uh, there are variants of, of, of these kinds of plants and uh, other continents as well. The indigenous population figured out that you had to, again, qu- in quotes there, figured out were, were, <laughs> were given tutelage uh, at some point in the, in the either near or, or distant past on how to make this stuff that actually suppresses that enzyme in the digestive tract so that they're able to actualize on the actual uh, DMT release in the plant. You know, our our bodies make a certain amount of it, but it's minuscule compared to the amounts. Um, and you know, Straussman talks about this in his his book that Derek mentioned a moment ago. But uh, it's so minuscule compared to the amount that you you would ingest uh, from uh, an ayahuasca trip. It, it just doesn't doesn't even compare. And clearly, if the if if these experiences that uh, 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 researchers like Straussman and others are, are bringing back, are, are, are bearing this kind of fruit, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, it, it should be caused not, not for embracement, but people should, people should be getting, you know, parental warnings and, and labels stuck on this stuff. Like, you know, imperil your eternity, eternity uh, at your own risk. If you ingest this stuff, because it's not it's not just some sort of biochemical experience that you'll go through where you discover yourself. You're actually going to be, you know, trafficking with these these entities that don't have your best interest at heart. That's one of the things that struck me was in, in talking about this once with Josh Peck. That uh, you know, Josh has come out of the New Age and he's been very open about that. But he was uh, experimenting with. Uh, with astral projection. And he said that he experienced a very similar uh, encounters with, with other entities when he was, you know, floating around and leaving his body that he was uh, running, running into these things. Uh, It very sounded very, very similar to the people who were volunteering for these DMT experiments. So the the question then is what are these things? Where do they come from? 
exactly. Uh, the the whole UFO thing, um, and the relationship of the of the demonic world. I, I'm curious to see what you guys think about that. Well, I I think um, first of all, like understanding this in context, and uh, you know, which is, you know, of course, we're now in a very postmodern culture where there's you know chaos. It's complete chaos. But I mean, I still see that we're still heavily rooted in a materialistic worldview, you know? And I mean, even the postmodernism, you know, I've been reading a lot on, on that and um, the whole thing about uh, trans ideology, trans, radical trans ideology, you know, the, the concept is that the, it's pretty much Gnosticism where the body is just material matter and it's not even good matter. And so that's why the, the inner mind is the, the, the soul or whatever they call it. Mm you know, individual call it, that's your true um, identity of who, who and what you are. And so you you can alter the physical, you know, it's got that Gnostic notion to it. But it's, it, you know, I'm thinking it's interesting that we are in, we still have highly materialistic, scientific sort of thing. And even myself, you know, it's not, it's funny. I, I can imagine a lot of people, even when they read the Bible, they don't necessarily think of the spiritual aspect connected to these. And you really have to, you know, you, of course, Doug, you've already, you just mentioned the word pharmakia, but like if the listeners aren't familiar with that, you know, pharmakia is, is the word for sorcery that is used for sorcery in the, uh, in the New Testament for sure. And I don't know what the equivalent is in the, in the um, Old Testament. Someone can find that. But, um, but, you know, Paul says in Galatians 5.20, the works of the flesh are idolatry, that's spiritual worship, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, etc., and in Revelation, sorceries comes up a lot because, and of course, the Revelation that it's a very spiritual, uh, very spiritual context. How, however, your interpretation is, it's about them not repenting from their murders in Revelation nine twenty one, not repenting from their murders or their sorceries or their <coughs> sexual immoralities. You know, and then Revelation twenty one eight again, the same list of sexually immoral sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. These are the ones who have been like you know turning from God and stuff in the text. And so, um, but that word for sorcery is pharmakia, and this is where, you know, I, I have to be honest, like, you know, w when I first hear these references, even that you guys make, because I'm not, I haven't read as much on it you have as you have, but, you know, you the normal idea is not to connect the two. It's not to connect the the, the drugs with spiritual world. And right. and to hear, I, 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 here's what I got to say, to hear that, the natural reaction in me being highly affected by the materialistic worldview, even though I, you know, I believe in supernatural view of the Bible, et cetera, but I'm just saying I can see how it affects us because it, I hear that uh, sorcery or, or um, uh, drugs and, and connected to the demonic realm, and I can see how most people would hear that and just go, that's, that's crazy, you know, the, no, those two don't have any connection. You know, one's physical and drugs and you just get hallucinations. And how can that have a spiritual reality? But as a Christian, you know, seeing that in the Bible, like, oh, no, pharmakia, it's sorcery. Sorcery was the use of drugs to create the same experiences in the ancient world as today. There's there's no difference. And, you know, if I could also just for the sake of our, our listeners, read one of the texts you also mentioned, for instance, Enoch, you know, where it's talking about the... Um, the Watchers in Enoch, first Enoch 8, talks about Azazel teaching war, knives, shields, those kinds of things. But then it says, and Amasraz taught incantations and the cutting of roots, and Armoros, the resolving of incantations, and Barakil, astrology, and Kokoriel, the knowledge of signs, and Tamel taught the seeing of the stars, and Asdorel taught the course of the moon and the deception of man, etc., and so just seeing that is where I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking like, because I kind of feel like I'm, I'm more on, on the outside of, of this. Like I said, I think you guys have studied this more than I have. But, but it's, it's, it's profound because people need to realize, I think, how much that materialism has affected us, even Christians, when we don't see that there is this natural connection between that spiritual world and the drugs, it's just, yeah, so I, you know, I, I just wanted to share that because um, that's what I was been thinking of and like thinking, wow, yeah, you know, you guys are really right. And and you're talking about it, you're, you're already jumping into that, but I'm like, at first I'm like thinking, 
wait a minute, drugs, demons, what? Most people are going to go, how is that connected? But when you really look at the scriptures, look at the ancient um, texts that are that back it up and such, and that's where you start to see, oh, the spiritual connection there, that the modern materialist worldview has completely just just uh, devastated, just just pushed away um, to the point where I think even Christians aren't getting that, you know? Yeah, I mean, we're, we've been conditioned that anybody who wears a white coat, like the uh, the friendly pharmacist, yeah, is is got your best interest at heart, you know. They and they know me on a first name basis at our local pharmacy. So you know, I'm not anti pharmaceuticals for you know things that have been prescribed, uh, but uh, it is interesting that that word. I think we can also take it too far in the other direction that all drugs are bad, and that's that's not right. what the scriptures are saying. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's a good point. Let's uh, let's step Clarify. back for a minute because I don't think that the I, I know that what I'm I'm not saying is that all drugs are pharmacia. Right. Um, right. Right. You know, by I, I think what I mean is that um, there's a certain kind of drug or concoction that can that that's deliberately created to help you cross over to go to the other realm certainly not all drugs that you buy at a pharmacy are that way I th- a little caveat i think it's important to know well maybe a couple little caveats because when we think of a pharmacy right there brian i think you've got and derek even alluded to it i mean it's the white coat it's the science it's yeah the, this is what this is what we do and there's nothing going on that's out of the ordinary at all this is completely good because hey it's legal <laughs> you know yeah. i've got to go to the doctor to have it prescribed to me so it's got to be okay, but LSD, that's illegal, and so that's what people go tripping on, and so that's got to be a bad thing. It's like we, we're we not integrating how we think about this word pharmacia, and it's yeah. not that all drugs are hallucinogenic or created to do that, but it should be also noted that almost all drugs, if not all drugs, do have a natural root to them. I mean that literally, like the roots, the plants. Sure. And all we're really doing is just kind of modifying them with some kind of artificial, uh, you know, um, concoction in order to be able to um, make money off it. And I think <laughs> I make money off a plant. So. I think what you said is, is true that it's the context too, because um, there can be, you know, uh, you know, it's using drugs with this particular intent or context of seeking to, as you said, either achieve altered states, cross over, make spiritual connections, or whatever. Um, I think that's the, the that that's that's the element, that's the component that to me makes the most amount of sense. That separates it from the use of drugs as a, uh, a medical material uh, attempt to uh, you know correct our medical structures in our bodies, right? Uh, but when you're using it to actually achieve connection with some kind of altered state of consciousness or some higher conscious, whatever they define it as, that's like the Ouija board. That's how I see it. Mm-hmm. That's how it seems yeah. like to me that when you start using that as that Ouija board to reach out to entities, or maybe you don't even see it as entities. Maybe you just see it as uh, opened, you know, raised consciousness like the, you know, many materialists would see, but it still is the Ouija board. And that makes sense to me. That's, that's where I can process it and say, you know, my original, uh, reaction, you know, is, is, is a bias that, that I need to, um, be aware of and understand context can change things, you know? You know, it's, it's, and what those guys were saying on uh, on the show was it was almost exact opposite of that. So, um, you know, they would tell us, you guys have no business talking about this until you do your own trips and, and do it for yourself. I mean, we've heard that. You hear that all over the place with all kinds of topics. But this one, they would especially say that. And what I'm saying <laughs> is, as a Christian, I'm concerned because I'm forbidden from doing that. And there's got to be a good reason why. If God is the good God, um who knows what's best for us, and he's forbidding us crossing over, there has to be reasons for that. And I think that that kind of takes us to the heart of this whole idea of of the demonic spirit world. Something that whether they call it naturalism or materialism, or whether they're more honest and say, yeah, there's entities that are there, which I think some of those guys, they would say that. <laughs> but maybe they're just not malevolent or whatever the case might be. They, they know not what they do. Right, Yeah. <laughs> 
And Brian, it's concerning. Uh, Brian, you, you made a really interesting observation, uh, Azazel, or uh, t- taking the blame for teaching us these these things that we weren't supposed to know, teaching humanity in, in the distant past. I've been doing some reading on the, the, the next chunk of the book of First Enoch that most of us, or at least I had not really been familiar with, the book of parables. Which begins, right. starts at chapter thirty-seven, goes to chapter seventy-one. I finally started to read that because it was pointed out to me that um, the title uh, "the Son of Man," which Jesus applied to himself over and over in the New Testament, doesn't appear in any Jewish writing until uh, uh, until the Book of Parables, which was written in the first century BC. But I noticed in chapter fifty-five of First Enoch that um, when God is speaking about when He's going to execute judgment on the fallen angels. Uh, he doesn't mention Shemiyaza at all. He says, when I, when I have desired to take hold of them by the hand of the angels on the day of tribulation and pain because of this, because of their rebellion, I will cause my chastisement and my wrath to abide upon them, saith God, the Lord of spirits. Ye mighty kings who dwell on the earth, ye shall have to behold mine elect one, the Messiah, how he sits on the throne of glory and judges Azazel and all his associates and all his hosts in the name of the Lord of spirits. But Shemiyaza was the chief of the watchers back in First Enoch six. He just there's no mention of him in the book of uh, in the book of parables that I've stumbled across yet. So, does that say something about the uh, the sin of Azazel and 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 getting us to try to open these portals through Pharmacia? I think just that a thought. it must because yeah I I I, I think that it has to because. Going back to the earlier, you know, the initial passages in First Enoch, you know, we 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 get that <clears throat> we get that uh, uh, relatively short list of of things that Azazel does, but it was it was significant enough to, you know, lay all of this culpability on him. Uh, the this the, revealing the the uh, m- mysterious or secret things of heaven uh, uh, undoubtedly ha- has has much to do with the pharmacia that the the watch stage. I mean, j- just just the context of of those passages, it, it must have something very integral. And it's clear that Azazel was teaching a kind of witchcraft to uh, to early humanity. So the question, then, if we're as desensitized to this as um, as we appear to be, and Brian, I think you make a really good point. We are all sort of soaking in a scientific culture where we we venerate the white coat, um, regardless of who's inside of it. Uh, how do we recognize then um, evil incarnate when it's right in front of us? I mean, for example, four years ago we had the the tragic and horrific slaughter at Parkland uh, over in uh, in Florida. And when he was talked to investigators, the uh, the shooter Nicholas Cruz told them that he heard voices in his head telling him, telling him to burn, kill, destroy, and telling him to kill himself. And most people seeing the story said, "Well, yeah, of course he's nuts. That's why he shot and killed, you know, seventeen people." But what if he's telling the truth? Yeah, there's a fine line between being nuts or being demonized in some way or another. Just like the Bible makes a distinction between epilepsy and uh, and demon possession, and yet demon possession can manifest uh, seizures just like epilepsy. So, yeah. you know, this is the this is the element that I'm you know that I that I'm trying to respond to and trying to sort of uh, identify with. Now, obviously, your audience is more obviously likely on our side, but I still, you know, just be, being in connection with the evangelical world at large, you know, it's it's. It's you, you know you you get to the point where you know you start you 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 become cautious about people who are uh, saying things like that's demonic and you know it's like you mm. know is, are these just whatever kooky Christians or whatever but but I'm but it's like no no not necessarily this this is very this could be very real but I do think what you're saying Doug is important because. It's not black and white, and so we have to be careful, I guess, as well, in terms of what we are going to to uh, um, define and such. And it does make it difficult, you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, like I said, I haven't studied as much, and so, um, but it is it is certainly worthy of Christians to 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 really consider that that reality, you know. 
I mean, we're living in a world where we're seeing things that that, and maybe it's the the you know twenty four hour news cycle now, thanks to cable news and the internet. But uh, yeah, um, where people are taking vehicles and using them as as weapons, you know, driving through a crowd or driving through a parade or or what have you, things that I don't remember as a kid. And again, maybe it's that we're just not surrounded by, we weren't surrounded by news all the time back then. So we just didn't see this, this kind of thing happening. I mean, I know there's always been evil. Just, you know, look at your typical Assyrian King's inscriptions of his victories and his, it's like uh, pretty, pretty evil stuff. But is, is it happening more? And if so, is it our, the, the culture around us, the things that we're consuming through television, movies, video games, uh, the video game industry, which now surpasses Hollywood in terms of annual uh, sales, um, which especially for young men as, as an escape uh, is, is really influential. I mean, are, are we seeing people, kids conditioned through those now to where, you know, they, they just don't see the behavior as aberrant or maybe they're yeah. not as able to, to tell the difference. I mean, Hey, they've been conditioned to believe that uh, this isn't a real reality. This is just a sim. So who cares? And you see people doing this with, uh, you know, they'll see something on on a news broadcast, some kind of blood and guts thing. And their response is, boy, that looks just like the video game. Yeah. It's like the exact opposite of reality. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's so it, so again, it's that's te- we live in a highly technological society. And it's like the more technological we get, it's almost like maybe the more spiritual it's becoming, but in a way that people can't accept or understand because it's only technology, right? And so uh, what comes to mind is uh, Matthias Desmond, you know, and he wrote, he wrote that book um, that talks about mass psychosis, mm-hmm. and he was trying to describe what was happening. Of course, he comes from a you know, humanistic psychological uh, interpretation, but very valuable text, and, and, and it really helped to explain a lot of what was going on in COVID, you know. But it remind it makes me also remember, I don't know if you guys have ever read Walter Wink. You know, he's written a lot on spiritual warfare stuff. And he tends to be more of a liberal and a little older writer and stuff. But he he was one that would, yeah, he'd be a little bit more in, liberal in, in his interpretation. But I still thought like he what, what he was saying, what, there was some sense to it and, and just that might need to be readjusted within our context. And that was, you know, he, he, he would talk about, it, it would kind of be like he'd be saying, um, you know, the Bible very clearly talks about the spirit of the age and spirits and stuff like that. And of course, he felt like uh, what he described it as was that that um, perhaps it was something along the lines of it's a reality. It's not like it's a myth or anything, but it's a reality that comes out of the more the collective. And this is where I'm thinking of mass psychosis. The, the 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 collective like Babylon right or something like that right the the more that the collective unifies in its evil, um, a a tr- a transcendent evil sort of uh, is manifest within that you know, and of course we might say well yes of course you know uh, whether it's the watcher or or whatever but it's interesting from even from his humanistic perspective he was trying to recognize that there's a transcendent demonic reality that arises out of the mob, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, maybe, you know, Mm. uh, let me put it this way. Um, I'm I'm surely there would be an interpretation that would say, no, it preexisted it. But but even within the current context, I guess what I'm saying is I do see we are becoming more of a mob-oriented society, and I am more willing to call that demonic, uh, and and not not in a humanistic way, but but uh, in a way that I would guess I would say ten years ago I would feel like you know oh that's Pentecostal goofiness or something you know <laughs> and I no longer think that way because I see the 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 demonic nature of the mob you know and uh, I think that's so interesting Brian because what you're doing is you're taking it from what I think most of us talk about with demons is individual sort of thing this person this person this person and when you attach the idea of the demonic realm to a group like that. Uh, here's kind of another example uh, of, of the one and the many. I once asked a guy, do you think that a demon could inhabit a website? Right. And he goes, yeah. and he goes do you think that a demon can inhabit the web? The whole thing. Yeah. And he just, he just kind of switched the question on me and I just like, oh, my word, I didn't, you know, what do you even do with that? 
Um, there, there was a, with, there, there's a short story by Harlan, Harlan Ellison from, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago called, I have no mouth and I must scream, which essentially is that it's, uh, this supercomputer called I am, <laughs> which, uh, decides that humanity is the problem. And so it eliminates humanity except for a group of uh, five or six people that it just keeps alive and, uh, artificially long just so that it can torture them. And so their existence comes down to trying to find a way to kill one to kill themselves so they can escape this torture. And they all die except for the narrator who's you know telling the story in first person, who then has been biologically changed in such a way that there's no way he can hurt himself. He's like a like an amoeba. And and hence the title of the story, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. And it's it's really chilling. I mean, Harlan Ellison was a gifted writer. Uh would that he have written you know, for the truth. But uh, anyway, th- that's not too far different from what uh, your your friend was uh, suggesting there. I mean, look, if it's, it's, it's an electronic uh, processing machine. The, the human mind is sort of a bioelectrical processing device. And we know it can be, you know, overwhelmed by an Co-opted. external entity. So, yeah, 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 why not? Well, so here's the challenge I would I would make back on that is, you know, do, do any of you know of any biblical you know, basis uh, for that claim. Like if like my, just my limited study of, of demons in the scripture. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure most of all of us here agree with the, the, the idea that uh, a lot of Christians have actually a, uh, an inaccurate or imprecise understanding of demons. You know, they'll call them fallen angels. You know? Right, yeah, right, and um, that's the most common, I think, misunderstanding that, and I think we need to 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 get rid of these notions because it does muddy up the waters, right? And so, even though the Bible has doesn't say that anything about where evil spirits come from, just that they exist, but it very clearly makes them as un uh, un unbo- whatever unembodied uh, spirits seeking embodiment in, and in human beings. And so that's fine. I get that. And I could even, tr- I can even say, you know, okay. As, and, and as an organic whole, our humanity can become a kind of a whole in which could have that spirit over us. Yeah, that's, that's legit. And of course that matches the watcher paradigm, right? Sure. But my question would be, but can it really, uh, can, is there a biblical basis for the, the thought that a, a demon could in, inhabit a, mechanical structure that's not organic, that's not human. And the reason why I'm asking that too is because transhumanism is the next big thing that, and it's the belief that the consciousness can actually be imported into there. And I don't think that's possible actually. Uh, Now, you know, maybe, maybe science will prove me wrong because it it sometimes has, but it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like that's feasible to me. But, but those are just some thoughts to, to throw out there. If you guys, uh, you know, have any any ideas about how to address those? Well, here's a here's well, a couple of thoughts come to my mind. Is uh, one would be just the uh, I know I know it's it's not mechanical, but when the legion wants to go into the pigs, they're not going into a human. They want to go into something else. Okay, then, fair enough. And then I also think about Daniel and the beast, and then Revelation and the beast. And it depends on your eschatology, obviously. But if you if you were to consider the idea that the beast could be a system, uh, an economic system, um, something like that, even even in the you know the 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 dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the statue, and and it's representing these kingdoms. Um, it it seems to me it's more than just a king. It's and it and it's more. It seems it has to be more than just even the people of the kingdom or the or the you know the warriors or something. It's the it's the whole system that becomes the beast. And, you know, you'd have to be probably a little bit more technical on what you mean by a demon, but it certainly seems at the very least that there's demonic, demonic, yeah. spiritual, supernatural sure. reality that's going on, something that is not um, that's not human, uh, maybe not even itself intelligent. I don't know. Well, I, I'd like I'd like to chime in real quick. Um, you know, uh, although it's it's not. Uh, it's not like a computer system or a, a network or anything like that. Um, you know, we do have a precedent for this sort of of ideation in the ancient world. I mean, it's clear that that ancients believed. Uh, take, you know, any of the major, major, you know, five Mesopotamian civilizations. 
you know, they would parade their patron gods down the central thoroughfare, the Cardo Maximus, if if you will, uh, on feast days, and they they clearly believed uh, that their the, these representations, these effigies of their gods, were inhabited by their gods, uh, and that's true of the other polytheistic peoples of the ancient Near East. And in fact, uh, you know, it's it's not unprecedented around the world, uh, and so this idea about about inhabiting a, a non-organic, uh, you know, object or, or structure or what have you, is not what certainly not without precedent in the the world that was contemporary with the Bible. Yeah, they were sort of like con- the, the idols were considered sort of a, a house, a, a yeah. host, or, or house like a like a radio yeah. tuner for the. Uh, the deity, yeah. the, the teraphim, were used in those monthly rituals where you had to feed your ancestors. Right. And I know that. Uh, what about dolls in horror movies? <laughs> well, that yeah. my my, my daughter sent us. The, yeah. my daughter sent me uh, this one for Father's Day a few years ago, and I didn't oh know gosh. it was coming. Yeah, I didn't know it was coming, and this was just after I'd interviewed a deliverance minister on charged objects, objects that could be um, used uh, that to, to which a spirit could attach itself. Now there are some deliverance ministers who believe that that's that's real. I, I don't know for sure, but I, I saw this show up the next day, and it came from an address I didn't recognize. Cthulhu. And then our daughter called, yeah, she said, hey, you know, <laughs> she sent me Cthulhu for Father's Day. So. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks, Scott. <laughs> well, but no, I mean, this is relevant because, you know, I mean, I there's there's obviously, like I could say, okay, the, demons could be, uh, you know, haunted house could be actual demons. It doesn't mean that they're inhabiting a location on the earth and it's the house. It's not, but, but to go further and say, okay, but can they inhabit things like those dolls or something that seems a bridge too far for me on the surface. Um, however, I do believe, I do believe that, um, that we use, and this gets back, this gets back to drugs. And I think it, 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 it fits that, that doesn't mean that things can't be used in conjunction with our reaching out to the spiritual. So, so the Ouija board is technology. I do believe, though, that the act of engaging the Ouija board is the the, the spiritual person. Or, or, I'm sorry, that it's the person uh, w- using whatever they are to try to open themselves up to that world. I think that's kind of like that passage in Peter. You know, baptism saves you, not the washing of the water. But the appeal from the good conscience. Well, in reverse, I, I, that makes sense to me, sure. But can, can there be can there be these actual items or objects, whether it's a doll or what have you, where they could be infested with demons? That I, I, I you know, I don't know. And, and Judd, I mean, you know, what you say about the images? Oh, absolutely, yeah. No, that's a really good point and really good argument. And certainly, I can see that the spirituality con- connected with that is certainly de- demonic. Um, and, uh, and maybe, maybe there's something to that. Maybe there is, or is it, that's what they believe, but that doesn't mean that's the reality. I don't know. Here, here's one more thing to maybe add to, especially the internet or these kinds of electronic, uh, technologies. Cause it's kind of a, to me, it's kind of a halfway thing. Like, is the internet alive or is it not alive? I and mean, we're kind of talking about that. Well, we, we know that it, there's a couple components to it that I, I think of one is energy, and they certainly had an idea of energy in the ancient world. I mean, they used to talk about the energies of God. The Eastern Church talks about that all the time. Um, the two powers in heaven. I mean, <laughs> that, that's, oh. that's energy kind of language. Yeah. So they had the idea of energy. And if we're using that same, I know it's you're, you're removed by a couple of different languages. But in English, you know, we're, we're you're using that, that language. We plug into this energy grid. And then the second part of it is light. Um, light is a necessary component of the internet. Um, with no light, there is no internet. And what is light? I mean, we, we can talk about it from a physics point of view. Is it a, is it a wave or is it a particle, right? They don't know. At least they didn't in the eighties when I took physics, (laughs) they still don't. Um, right. And so it's like, but what is this thing? Well, we can go to the scripture. We do know that, you know, Satan masks uh, masquerades as an angel of light. And we know that Jesus is called the light of the world. And I, I, I tend to think that there's more than just metaphor going on there. Maybe there's some kind of a, almost like a sacramental union or something. I don't know. I mean, even with stars and the and the gods, you know, there's light that's involved with that. So if we're dealing with light and energy, 
have we tapped into the supernatural realm by default in a metaphysical sense? And we're just not, we're not thinking about it. We're not asking those kinds of questions. And therefore, you know, the whole idea of could it be inhabited by a demon just seems abs- absurd, but maybe it's not quite as absurd as we think. Well, again, the human brain and th- the, the idea of thinking is just a process of your, your brain making sense of electric signals that are, that are moving back and forth between the, uh, the neurons inside your head. So, uh, sure. But now, now the traditional Christian, you know, by the way, I'm not necessarily, uh, I mean, I'm very, I'm, I have a open understanding about the body soul distinction in scripture mm-hmm. myself, but the traditional Christian Orthodox understanding is that, uh, the soul of the spirit is, yeah, it actually interacts with yeah. the physical body and yeah. maybe that's what the electricity is, but it is a separate thing. It's sure, a separate entity sure. that exists apart from it. But, you know, but you, you know, you make a good point is that, okay, well then that means if you take the spirit out, then that body is a dead or uh, whatever, dead organism or a dead machine, so to speak. Right. Um, so, so, but, <coughs> but the question is, um, we are, we are in the image of God and that's, that's where I think the ultimate connection comes from because animals are not, of course, maybe an animal could be possessed by a spirit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just processing this myself. Um, and, and the Bible does say that we are, the word image is the same word as the icon or the, you know, the idols that are used of the, you know, so he's literally saying in the same way that the pagan people believe that those statues are their connecting point with the gods uh, or represent the gods on the earth. So you are my representational beings, you know, and that's a very distinct uh, ontological reality. I think that, that, you know, philosophy has not been able to answer fully, but, but I, and I think that's the realm that I'm delving in because, you know, and, and I, I don't want to take this down a specific path, but it does the mind body distinction ten, tends to come to mind here. And yeah. I am thinking transhumanism or well, transhumanism, yeah. you know, and, and I can see that as the, as a, certainly a demonic, you know, cause it's self idolatrous and all that. But my question always comes to, but is it possible? Can you download your spirit to a machine, to a computer? Um, at this point, I don't believe it's possible, but I don't understand all the factors involved either. So, um, I don't know if any of you guys have, have read more on that, but, uh, but I guess it is relevant to the demonic aspect, you know, demonic in comp- are the demons in computers or whatever. Maybe here would be an interesting question to go, because I don't know that we can go any farther with this. I mean, maybe Judd could, but I, I don't think I can. Um, but maybe it's not necessarily necessary to know if a demon can inhabit the web or a website or whatever, but certainly they can use it. And, um, you know, I, part of the initial question was, you know, around where we're at today are, are is there a kind of a, a demonization that people are not recognizing? Um, I yeah. tend to think that something uh, really radical has changed in our culture with the creation of the internet and the demonic world. I don't know that I can put my finger on it, but you, I mean, you just look at the proliferation of pornography and how rampant that is, how easy it is to have access to and how, um, uh, binding it is on a soul yeah or you look at the way that people treat one another in chat rooms um it's dehumanizing mm-hmm. like that if if there's anything that's demonic i don't know that that seems to fit perfectly i mean and it feels like it's more than just it's being used for evil ends it seems like this is a tool that like it's almost like it was created for those ends i don't know <laughs> you know what i mean i'm just saying that yeah Something radical has changed with the invention of this technology in our culture that I think is related to the demonic world that I just, you know, I, I, I would like for Christians to be thinking about it more. It certainly yeah, facilitates. I, I agree. It, it certainly facilitates uh, activities that that would not have been allowed when we were kids. I mean, I just imagine today your, your typical 12 year old going to bed with a phone that's connected to the Internet all night long, you know. And you, as a parent, you you have no idea who's which, which what these strangers are that are now in, in your child's bedroom. That that never would have happened when I was twelve. Yeah, yeah. Judd, you're going to say something. 
Uh, yes. Uh, this this subject, in a, a general sense, has been on my mind just, just in terms of research for the last couple of years. And I, I, last year, um, I, I wrote a paper on uh, uh, the the use of royal words that were related to Rephaim and Raba and all that right. um, in Eurasian languages. And so, this sort of of weaponization of culture. By the by, the demonic is a precedent that's really set by the watchers because of all of the these sort of uh, basic fundamental institutions that they they literally lay the groundwork for in a in a mockery of the system that Yahweh has in heaven, uh, and it, you know so much so that the words that we use even to this day for king and ruler uh, are are not only you know linguistic relate related you know lots lots of r words lots of regal and rex and rajan and you know i, I do a more detailed uh, analysis of this in the paper uh but it, it's it, it's clear that that a lot of things that we we consider to be the natural flow of ideas let's say through historical linguistics maybe something much more ancient and nefarious uh, given given the sort of ideological baggage that these cognates, these words drag around with them, and so uh, you know, to your point uh, about the the internet being weaponized and somehow I I I I, I couldn't stand in disagreement with that because it, either from the perspective that it's been it's been a weaponized invention or that it was actually engineered by entities that were fluent in this kind of watcher tech to begin with. Yeah. And to support Doug, what you're saying too, it's like, you know, what came to my mind is because I'm definitely persuaded that, 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 um, that social connectivity, you know, the internet, but the, the result, the, the, the social connectivity that we have is, is more bad than good for sure. It's, it's, and I see it, it is the thing that is, creating the ironically in a sense at the same time the um the uh polarization in our uh, in our world but because of the ability of more people of the collective to connect so this is this is where i would say you know what what you're saying is this is babel i mean this is the return to babel and the return the babel was it wasn't the building being built up to reach the heavens, it was the connectivity to the gods, and that was the whole yes. what the ziggurats were. And so, it the I I do see the internet as the the return to Babel, and and the the resultant demonic evil from that that we are seeing makes sense within that context and where it's leading. And so, okay. um, right. so so in that sense, I definitely yeah, I, I definitely see the demonic nature of it. And it's just kind of interesting that, um, you know, it would be that that sort of, oh, my point being, what was the essence of God's separation of Babel was, you know, I mean, in, in our modern words, <laughs> to stop the global governance, to stop the one world government, of which would ultimately be idolatry, and it's the deification of humanity. Well, what what more is the worst form of the mob that we have is the ability of more people to be able to be united in connectivity, to be able to therefore magnify that evil like never before in history. Right. And, yeah. and, and, you know, we had always seen, well, that's how movements would arise. They, they would get to know each other. They print things and, and, ooh, and then they could get on the phone, but still it, you know, people were still separated, separated, you know? And, and so it's like the internet has, has, a, is going to allow the global mob of Babel like never before. I, and and I do I do see that as demonic, absolutely. And interestingly, when you get right down to the basic languages that run the computers that we use, it's all bits and bytes, machine language one zero one zero one one zero zero. We're all back to speaking a single language. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. Hmm. Well, next you month. Know, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, one more thing I want to bring up. Um, this was on my mind earlier. Um, you kind of raised the question uh, earlier, Derek, a little bit uh, with video games and stuff. And I, I kind of had the same idea because I run into people talking about this a lot that, man, you guys shouldn't even be talking about Satan or demons. You're just opening yourself, opening yourself up. Really? <laughs> yeah. And, um, 
I don't know if it's a superstition or, or you know, their tradition or, or what's going on there. And I was reminded about this because just the idea of technology as a tool, like I don't believe that the Internet is bad. Right. I don't believe that the Internet is good. I had a professor, uh, Doug Grotheis at Denver Seminary, who said technology isn't good. It's not bad. And it's not indifferent. And it blows people away. What do you mean? It's not good or bad or indifferent. Right. It's a tool. All technology, it lends itself to some good things. All technology lends itself to some bad things. And it's never neutral. <laughs> yeah, the medium and is the message in many, in many ways. The medium is the message, yeah. And so, you know, to, to say that, well, somebody playing a video game, are they opening themselves up to the supernatural? Well, they might be. They don't have to be. You can be, you know, the same with the idea of watching a horror movie. How many people, Brian, have you run into that, you should never watch horror movies. I mean, I remember you talking about this in one of your uh, online mm -hmm. classes, like the yeah. woman comes up to you afterwards and, and well, you, you should never only think about what is true and what is good is beautiful. And you're like, well, what's the first one of those? It's true. What is true? Think about what is true. <laughs> and horror is true. And, yeah. uh, you know, so it, yes, these things can lend themselves to bad things, but Christians can also think through them. And we have to interact with them, and we all interact with the internet, with our phones, with the radio, all these kinds of things. And we need to be thinking about them. And I think that it's important that we not think superstitiously about them, right? Um, but to recognize that there there is real evil that's at the very least lurking nearby, if not possibly even in and through it. I don't know the answer to that question. And if we have our minds open to that understanding, and and we're led by the Spirit of God, then you know, I think that we're on much better footing than if we just kind of knee jerk against it and say we can never talk about this stuff. Um, if we do, then we're going to be opening ourselves up to demon possession. Well, th that that just lends itself to all kinds of trouble. If you ask, I, you know, I, and yet to affirm their side to some degree, it's like there there's there is a good examples of. Uh, people who would who might play these games, and if the games are oriented towards getting you to do witch things and warlock things, you and and you know even reading Harry Potter, I'm not against it intrinsically, but you know I know that you know that that she has enough real witch stuff, witchcraft stuff in there that I could totally see some uh, you know young people reading it and looking more into it and taking it more seriously. And and that you know that does that make all you know all Harry Potter wrong or evil? Um, no, not necessarily. But you can certainly see the danger of that if if it's oriented towards you know um, encouraging uh, you know pl even if it's just play like a, a video game would be. Let's just pretend we're doing satanic rituals <laughs> as part of the game. You know, what I mean, and they 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 probably have them that did that do that for all I know. You know, um, so. yeah, there was a video game that. Uh years ago when our daughter was you know, like eight, nine years old, uh, we played, which was called eternal darkness, which, uh, I'm, I'm startled now looking back at it, it's like, why did we ever think that was a good idea? Um, because it was, it was very Lovecraftian and to defeat these monsters at various steps of the way, you had to do things like cast spells and stuff. I was very early in my walk back in the, in the, in the day. Uh, but finally realized, wait a minute here. We've got a guy who's, uh, we're playing the, this level as a, as a, as a priest, a, a Christian priest. And we're having him cast spells, you know, even, even as a newbie Christian back then, I say that <laughs> th this isn't right. We should, let's, let's just stop where we're at. We're not going to go to the next level here. But uh, yeah. the bottom line is, though, that most Christians are in that place. When you see the research of the Barner Group month after month, year after year, saying 20, not only what, 37 percent of our, of our senior pastors have a biblical worldview, like 12 percent of our youth pastors have a biblical worldview, 6 percent of Americans have a biblical worldview. It's no wonder we can be looking at guys like Nicholas Cruz saying the voices in my head were telling me to kill. And he's just one example of many that we could we could we could do an entire program on, you know, one after another after another. And of course, the the gen, the consensus view is, oh well, he's just nuts. We can't recognize evil when it's staring us in the face anymore because we, and this is something else that struck me. Sharon's been watching the Netflix reboot of Unsolved Mysteries, you know, the old Robert Stack series. <laughs> Uh, th wisely, they did not cast somebody to try to fill Robert Stack's shoes. They show some mysteries that are just unsolved, cold case, criminal, you know, uh, nefarious things, but others that are, are really supernatural. Uh, one featured a couple of rangers on the Navajo 
uh, nation who encountered everything from uh, uh, skinwalkers to UFOs to uh, to Bigfoot sightings and cases and, and very plausible, credible cases. And then a, a, a really heartbreaking story of um, the many, many sightings of what people believe to be the ghosts of people who died. And this is from Japan, people who died in the massive earthquake and tsunami from 2011. Wow. I mean, to the point where multiple taxi drivers were reporting having passengers get in the cab soaking wet, dripping wet. They drive them to where they were supposed to go, and then there was no one in the cab. Now, one guy you could say, okay, that's, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. That guy's making something up, but it happens again and again, apparently. And then they interviewed a Buddhist monk who was counseling a woman who said, you know, the spirits, their spirits are coming inside me. I can't stop them. She was, from a Christian perspective, appeared to be legitimately demonically possessed. And he was trying to deal with it through Buddhist means. Now, setting aside the um, w- whether that was appropriate or not, you know, I-, I doubt it was as effective as he wanted it to be. But th- the point was this, the Japanese and the Navajo, when these stories came up, it's like, oh, yeah, you, you, this is the first time you've seen a skinwalker? Oh, yeah, no big deal. Whereas we, the scientific American, you know, inheritors of anglo-saxon culture or whatever we're like no this can't possibly happen and yet when something does happen that we cannot explain through natural means we're we're totally flummoxed and as christians we should be the ones with the answers yeah Yeah. do you guys think um we have never done this but with our audience you know um maybe it's worth asking a question i don't even remember what what we've done in the last nine shows if we've talked on this but do you think that it would be a good idea for us to kind of take a step back and uh, maybe in our next show talk about the different forms of the dead and of demons and what they are and how the scripture talks about that? That's not a bad idea. In fact, I brought up a paper that uh, was written by a, uh, a deliverance minister who was referred, I, who was recommended to me years ago by, by Mike Heiser. So, uh, um, Dr. Is Thomas Hawkins. Paper? Yeah. He's, he's, uh, he's, since passed on it's it's basically the reality of that deliverance ministers run into that there are certain types of spirits that they encounter that are more powerful than others and that uh, they can sometimes invite retribution onto the deliverance minister as well as the person being delivered so wow i will forward that to you fellows and maybe we can maybe uh, we should see if uh if have the audience have them respond back and say yeah we'd like to have you do that or no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put that out there, but uh, I think that's a good idea. See if we can categorize what exactly we're dealing with. Doug Van Dorn, pastor of the Reformed Baptist Church, Northern Colorado in Boulder. Brian Godawa, best-selling author, award-winning screenwriter, and our friendly neighborhood PhD, Dr. Jed Burton. Fellas, thanks again for another uh, entertaining, informative, and enjoyable conversation. Follow us on the web at vftb.net. You'll find the show notes there. Of course, you'll find them uh Pretty much everywhere, but that is our global audio visual hub for uh, this particular podcast. But uh, we are on YouTube, youtube.com slash Gilbert House. And if you're following us there, would appreciate if you'd take a moment to subscribe and then click the little notification button so that every time we post something new here, you'll get uh, you'll get a notice. It's about twice a week that we do something. Uh, but uh, you'll also also uh, we, we recommend that you download our mobile app uh, It's more than a mobile app, really, because now with smart TVs. Those that are compatible with Google's Chromecast or Apple's AirPlay, our app brings our programming by right into your smartphone or tablet, bypassing the gatekeepers of big tech. And then from there, you can cast the video of our weekly programs. This uh, podcast, of course, our weekly uh, broadcast shows, Sci Friday and Unraveling Revelation, and our weekly Bible study, which is audio only, but you can... Uh, Basically, take it from your phone or tablet and put it up on the big screen, if you so desire, without any wires. It is a free app, and it is uh, developed by a Christian company, which means that um, we're not going to be censored or shadow banned or suddenly pulled offline for something we said 18 months ago, as uh, has happened with some of these other tech companies. So you'll find the link at uh, vftb.net. It's in the top menu bar or at our main website. That's gilberthouse.org, gilberthouse.org slash app. Please take advantage of our monthly specials at our online store. We try to offer value for value through uh, through that uh, store. And we got some uh, things to tell you about. We got an, another virtual conference coming up, but one that's still underway. 
So please take advantage of Skywatch TV's virtual conference while that's still ongoing. That runs through February 4th. My presentation, actually uh, three of us in this conversation tonight, contributed presentations to the Skywatch TV conference, exposing the darkness. Doug Van Dorn did too. I guess he was covering for Brian. Uh, Judd Burton talking about Caesarea Philippi. And uh, I also get into the discussion of the uh, geography of Jesus' ministry. Why was he in the north? Why did he go to Caesarea Philippi? There's a reason for that. And uh, those are just uh, four of the uh, 24 or so presentations. Tom Horn's presentation, essentially a mini documentary in and of itself. Joel Richardson, Carl Gallup's Rabbi Zev Porat, uh, Dr. Egal German, who's been on this show several times now, the founder of the International Biblical Apologetics Association. And uh, you definitely want to check out his presentation, Pastor Mike Spaulding and, and many others. DefenderConference.com, still time to get access to these, plus the six Six uh, feature-length documentaries from Skywatch Films through uh, February 4th, DefenderConference.com. There is another uh, virtual conference coming up from Hear the Watchmen in the month of January. Uh, I will give you more details as I have information on that. Our tour of Israel coming up in March, March 19th through 30th of 2023, the optional three-day extension to Jordan. If, if you've got the time and this is uh, something you've always thought about doing, please give some thought to uh, coming with us. We've got two full tour buses already. We're going to we're gonna stop at three. We don't want to you know, get in, into any more complicated logistics than uh, three tour buses. I know there's some ministries that will go, like uh, uh, Jonathan Kahn told me once, they went over there with like 14 tour buses. So you don't get to meet everybody that's on the tour that way. So right now we're at about 100 people and... Uh, haven't checked on that in a couple of weeks, but it's about 100 people, and we're looking to uh, max out with a third bus. Uh, you find out, uh, you can get all the information on the tour at uh, gilberthouse.org slash travel, gilberthouse.org slash travel. And uh, God willing, we will go to Turkey next fall. I know we talked about that throughout this year. What with the situation between Russia and Ukraine, we decided it was wise to hold off. We're praying that things uh, work out, but... Uh, It'll happen in God's timing. We definitely want to see Gobekli Tepe and the churches of Revelation, uh, as well as some other sites, before uh, before we're not physically able to travel anymore. So uh, we will post information as um, we get it on next fall's planned tour of Turkey at gilberthouse.org slash travel. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen to this podcast, whether it's YouTube, our app, or uh, listening through any of our podcast outlets, which would include Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever else fine podcasts are sold. Our announcer, the inimitable DC Good. And A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House Ministries, released under Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0, international license. We do this because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. Bunker.